Shall we bow our heads together? Our gracious Father, we're thankful for your love, for your grace, for the sacrifice that you were willing to make that we might have a hope and a future. And we ask as we open your word that you would open our hearts, our minds, that Jesus would be lifted up and we would be drawn to him and we would be changed by his spirit, by his grace, is our prayer in his name. Amen. Famous last words. Has it ever gotten you into trouble? You know, something you said, sometime when you spoke a little bit too soon. Now, you know, in honor of my friend's retirement party, I'm going to talk about him. I know that's a surprise to him. <laughs> How many times do you remember, Steve, you had some famous last words that didn't work out right? A few, that's good. Do you remember when we first met a Monday night and some famous last words that you echoed, that you stated? You do? <laughs> For those of you that don't, you know, know the story, we happened to go to a Monday night football game between the Cardinals and the Bears. Some of you may remember that. You know, there were some famous statements from Denny Green about that. But we were watching it, and it was going very well. And I remember my friend Steve telling me, it's over. <laughs> and there were a lot of other people that believed it. You know, there were a lot of Bears fans that were leaving, thinking it was over. And before it was over, there were a lot of Bears fans running back, trying to get back to their seats, because it wasn't over. But, you know, we've all made some statements. Some, you know, it's over it's this it's that and it's not famous last words do you remember any maybe something that was said to you maybe something someone famous said you know you can find a lot of things on the internet I was interested and I didn't spend a lot of time looking but, you know, I didn't find a whole lot of real impressive famous last words that famous people had said just before they passed. But, you know, maybe you remember something that a family member, a loved one told you. If you were to have your last words, what would you want to say that people would remember? What would be the thing that you would want to say as your last words. Have you thought about it? Maybe it's not something we really want to think about, but you know, really, whatever it is that I would want to say at that moment ought to be something I'm saying all along, shouldn't it? If it's something that's important enough that the last thing I want people to remember me saying, maybe it ought to be something that they don't even need to hear at the last time because they've heard it so many times, they know. Jesus at the crucifixion. There are seven statements that are made there, seven words, sometimes people refer to it, but seven statements that Jesus makes just before his death on the cross. We're going to spend a few Sabbaths looking at Jesus' last words, Jesus' words from Calvary. But you know, they're not Jesus' last words. They are the words that he said before he died on the cross, but they're not the last words because you see the cross, the tomb, nothing could keep Jesus there. That is the good news of the gospel, that his last words before his death were not his last words. In fact, he had told them if some of the disciples would have remembered some of the words Jesus would have said, ironically like the scribes and the Pharisees did, it would have been a lot more pleasant experience because they would have remembered that Jesus said, I'm what? I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be crucified. And what's going to happen? On the third day, I'm going to rise again. Instead of cowering in fear in that upper room, I can imagine, of course, they didn't have the nice clocks and watches we do, but just kind of counting the seconds until Sunday. Maybe even as soon as the sun set Saturday night, making a pilgrimage to that tomb to wait and to watch 
what Jesus had said was going to happen. It's important to remember Jesus' words. It's important to remember what Jesus says on the cross. Seven statements. One person summarized them this. The first are words of forgiveness, words of salvation, words of affection, words of anguish, words of suffering, words of victory, and words of peace. Seven statements. We'll give them to you quickly. We're going to look at the first one a little bit, but you can kind of do your homework and work ahead if you want to. The first one we'll look at our scripture reading, Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. The second one is found a few verses later. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. In John chapter 19, verses 26 and 27. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. Matthew chapter 27, verse 46 about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The fifth. After, the, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. And the sixth. John 19, verse 30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowed his head and gave up the spirit. In Luke, chapter 23, verse 46. When Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. The first one in Luke. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. How often does Jesus intercede for us because we do not know what we, were, what we are doing and the significance of it? Jesus' first words on the cross... Maybe even as he's being nailed, we don't know exactly the time frame. But they're words of forgiveness. All that Jesus has suffered from this point, everything that he's gone through. You know, I'm guessing that my thoughts would not be words of forgiveness. I'm guessing that yours wouldn't be either. If you had gone through what he had gone through, being taken in the middle of the night, given these mock trials, being taken from Pilate to Herod to Pilate, back and forth, mocked, beaten. And yet his words are, Father, forgive them. He is going through the worst death that the Romans could find. The worst, the most painful, excruciating death that evil men could come up with. Jesus is experiencing and his words are, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Jesus' words are words of forgiveness. I wonder when we're going through trials, when people are mistreating us, is the first thought in my head, Father, forgive them. I'm guessing maybe you're not at that point in your spiritual growth. I'd like to tell you your pastor is, but he's not either. But by the grace of God, that's what I need to be. That's what we need to be as Christians. 
that whatever happens, our first response are thoughts of redemptive intercession for others. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, talks about Jesus. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always, what? Lives to make intercession for them. My friends, when did Jesus start making intercession for us? There was that plan before the world was created, but the moment that Adam and Eve sinned, there was an intercessor, there was a Savior who says, I will pay the price. Jesus has always, throughout the history of this sinful world, lived to make intercession for you and for me and for everyone. The only way to God is through Jesus. He is our intercessor our high priest, and he longs to reconcile our broken relationship with God. And the first step is forgiveness. There can be no reconciliation, there can be no healing without the forgiveness of God. And you see, God understands the only way for me, for you, for us to be reconciled is for God to initiate the healing process. And so God initiates the process of forgiveness. Forgiveness is a grace thing. It is not something I will ever earn, I will ever deserve, I will ever be worthy of, but it is something that I absolutely desperately need. And God has promised to supply my needs according to His riches. 2 Corinthians paints a simple picture of God's forgiveness, of God's intercession. For he made him who knew how much sin, no sin, to be sin for us that we might become what? The righteousness of God in him. My friends, my only hope is to have the righteousness of God. The righteousness of Moses is not good enough. The righteousness of Elijah is not good enough. If I can even say it, the righteousness of Enoch, none of them are good enough. What I need is the righteousness of Jesus. It is the only thing that is good enough. It is the only thing that can heal the broken relationship between God and me, between God and you. The reason Jesus is on the cross is because of my sin, is because of your sin, because he was willing to take our sin on himself that we might have his righteousness. Have you accepted his gift? The gift of forgiveness, the gift of righteousness by grace through faith. The gift that as soon as there was sin, there was a Savior. There is always a solution. Have you accepted it? Have you applied it to your life? That plan that God made before the foundation of the world. Have you accepted Jesus' plan for your reconciliation, for your forgiveness, your redemption, your salvation? Have you acknowledged your need? the reality of your condition. A lot of places we could look at, we're going to look at Romans chapter 3, verse 10. As it is written, there is what? None righteous, and in case you missed it, Paul repeats it, no, not one. How many righteous people are here this morning? Now, you know the pastor likes to ask trick questions. If you stop here, there's none. But if I have accepted Christ and put on the robe, I hope that everyone here is a righteous person because the righteousness of Christ is in him. That's the only way anyone will ever be righteous. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. 
apart from the grace of God, this is my condition, this is your condition, it is our condition, and it's not a pretty picture. How many are righteous? The Bible says none, not one, because all have sinned. You see, we all come with the same need. Your need is not different than mine. Oh, it may come out in different ways, but the bottom line is our needs are exactly the same. What we need is what? We need Jesus. We need his forgiveness. We need his righteousness. We need his grace. We need his spirit to work in us and through us and with us. We need Christ in us, the hope of glory. Have you invited Jesus into your life? Have you accepted the reality of your condition? And have you accepted Jesus' solution as the only solution? Are you in denial? Well, you know, I'm not really as bad as so-and-so. Congratulations. So you're not as lost as somebody else who is lost. Does that really help? You know, if you're more lost than me, does that really help? If we're both lost. Are you in denial of your condition and your need? You know, I'm a good person. That church in Laodicea who thinks they're in need of nothing. How many of us really fail to realize our condition? When Jesus prays, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Is Jesus talking about me? Is he talking about you? You see, I need Jesus. I need forgiveness. It is the only way that my life can be reconciled. A simple story on forgiveness. Luke chapter 7, starting with verse 36. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house, and he sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a what? When she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil. My friends, what do you do when you find out Jesus is around? Do you make your way to where he is, whether you're invited or not? Let me tell you, regardless of whether some people say you're invited or not, anywhere Jesus is, you are invited. For Jesus has said, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden. You are always invited into the presence of Jesus. Regardless of what someone else may tell you, Jesus always has an open door policy. You are always welcome. and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and she kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would know what kind of manner this woman is who is touching him. She is a sinner. Sure, I'm glad he pointed that out to Jesus, because otherwise Jesus probably wouldn't have known, right? My friends, I'm thankful that God knows what I am, and he invites me and he welcomes me in spite of what I am, because God knows what he can do in my life. You know, it's interesting, as I understand the custom, it mentions, you know, she let down her hair and was wiping his feet. Now, she had a reputation already. But in that day, you know, we have certain things culturally, you know, unwritten rules. We talk about them in sports sometimes. But this, you know, you don't do that unless you're a woman that, well, you know, you don't want to be that kind of woman. And she's touching him. And she's a sinner. 
My friends, I'm glad that sinners can touch Jesus. And he doesn't turn away. He doesn't respond like the Pharisees, like so many sadly supposed religious Christians. He welcomes us. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to pay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which one of them will love him more? Not a hard question to answer, is it? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one who he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. You know, often our judgment is not right. But in this case, Simon's judgment is right. Of course, again, he doesn't know how far his judgment goes. Then he turned to the woman and said, Simon, do you see this woman? Now, I love it, you know, when Jesus asks obvious questions. <laughs> do you see her? <laughs> of course, I know what kind of woman she is. If you knew, you wouldn't have any. Do you see this woman, Simon? This woman of ill repute that you think I ought not to have any. Do you see her? Do you really see her? You see, the problem is we don't really see people because we don't see people through Jesus' eyes. We don't see people by His grace. I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. Now, you know, we don't think of that. But that was one of the most basic common courtesies of the day. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss. But this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this who even forgives sin? You know, that probably wasn't asked with the right attitude, but it's the right question. Who is this who forgives sin? Who is the only one who can truly forgive my sins? It is Jesus. Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. You see, when by grace through faith I accept Jesus' forgiveness, I can have peace. It is the only way I will ever have peace. How much do you love Jesus? According to this simple story, it depends on forgiveness. It depends on how much you've been forgiven. Or maybe it depends on do you understand how much you have been forgiven. Now, you know, in that simple little story, what did we find? There were what? Two debtors. One owed 50, one owed 500. What did they have in common? The inability to pay, right? I mean, folks, does it really matter how much I owe if I can't pay it? Does it make me feel any better? Well, you know, you owe more than me. Does it really matter who owes the most if neither one of us have the money to pay? The sentence is the same for anybody in that day who can't pay their debt. You know, and it wasn't bankruptcy court. They were not that gracious and compassionate. Neither could pay their debt. Can you pay your debt? Romans 6, 23. That's simple scripture. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Can you pay your debt? How many of you want to vote yes? How many of you want to vote no? Once again, how many of you refuse to vote? <laughs> now, folks, this shouldn't be a hard question. Can you pay your debt? Think about it. What does the Bible say? The wages of sin is what? Death. Can you die? Yes. You can pay your debt. You can have the consequences of your sin, death. The problem I hope for all of us here is that's not the result I want. I want a different option. I want a different plan. You can die for your sins, but I want another option. I want the gift of God. And that is something I can never pay for. I can never repay. I can never be worthy of. But I can accept it by grace through faith. Do you want the gift of God? Are you trying to earn it? Are you trying to do something so that you can deserve it? How many have been given the gift of God? That was supposed to be an easy question. How many have been given the gift of God? Jesus died for how many people? All. Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them except for... Jesus paid the price for every sin. You see, all can be saved, all can be forgiven. But there is a condition, there is a catch. You have to accept the gift. You have to acknowledge your condition. Let me share a simple little story. It's made up. But I just want you to kind of imagine for a moment, you know the pastor likes Corvettes. And he's driving around and he sees this Corvette parked. And it is the most beautiful Corvette he has ever seen in his life. So, you know, I go over and I think, well, you know, I'll just snap a selfie. You know, I mean, it's you know, no harm in that, right? I just want to take a, just a picture, you know, just to kind of pretend for a moment that it's mine. And I get there, and I notice that, you know, the little key bob is in there. And, you know, we have all sorts of, you know, we know well, I probably ought to take the keys out and find out who they belong to. This is not safe to leave. And the door is open. And I get in, and, you know, well, I just want to feel like what it, feels like to sit in it and you know well I'm just sitting here you know it may as well just see if it starts and I push the button and it begins to purr and you can feel it kind of shake that engine and you know I kind of look around you know I'll probably never have this chance again I mean I don't see anybody I mean, I'm not going to do anything crazy. I'll return it. I'll bring it back. But, you know, just, you know, once, just to say I drove a Corvette. And I get out, and I begin to drive it. But, you know, I haven't gone hardly a second, and the lights begin to flash from multiple directions. And the policeman asked me what I'm doing. Well, I just wanted to drive it once. Is this your car? No. But I just wanted to, I mean, I wasn't going to hurt it. I, well, you know, it's not long before I'm headed to jail. And I'm sitting in my jail cell and all of a sudden, the officer says, you have a visitor. Okay, I didn't call anybody. You know, I'm a little embarrassed to admit, you know, your pastor's in jail. Who do you call? Uh, would you mind coming and bailing out your... You know, I didn't call anybody. And so anyway, somebody comes to my cell, and it's a lady. And she introduces herself. She says, hi, I'm Mary Barra. 
Do you know who I am? No, I don't. Well, I'm the one who owns the Corvette. Does anybody here know who Mary Barra is? Well, it just so happens she's the chairman and chief executive officer of General Motors Company. She introduces herself. She says, the Corvette that you stole, that's my Corvette. And you see, it's not just my Corvette. It's a special edition. There's only one of them that's been made. It was made for me. It's the only one of its kind like that. And I'm thinking, okay, this has gone from bad to worse. And then she gets a little gleam in her eye. And she says, you know what? I want you to have my Corvette. Now, I want you to understand I'm going to keep it in my name, but there's a reason for that. Because you see, as the chairman and the CEO, if you ever need anything for that Corvette, just take it into any Chevrolet, any GM dealership, and just say, this is my Corvette. This belongs to Mary Barra. And she says, you won't have problems getting anything you need for that car. Everything will be taken care of. And if you ever have a problem, here's my card. Now, this has my personal number. I only give this to a few people. But I always answer it. So if you do have a problem, just ask. Just use my name. And anything you ask in my name that you need for that car will be done. Kind of reminds you of a verse that we read. Anything that you ask in my name, Jesus says, I will do it. Well, you know, I'm thinking this is too good to be true. And the truth is, it is too good to be true. But you see, I've done something worse than steal a Corvette. I've crucified Christ. That hammer is me. It's you, it's us. And as I'm driving in those nails and the pain is tearing at Jesus, he says, Father, forgive him. He doesn't know. He doesn't understand. And Jesus says, you know, not only forgive him, but I want to give him my perfect righteousness. And I want to make him an equal heir with me. Everything I'm entitled to, I want him to have. When Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. That's what he was saying. Do you want to be an heir with Jesus? Do you want to have that kind of high priest Hebrews talks about it. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come, what? Boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Jesus says, if you ask anything in my name, if you ask anything in harmony with my will, you don't need to wonder if it's going to happen. It will happen. What do you need? Do you need mercy? Do you need grace? Do you need forgiveness? Do you need a new heart, a new spirit? Whatever you need, Jesus has paid for it. And he offers it to you as a gift. Will you accept Jesus, will you accept his gifts? Will you accept all that Jesus has paid for for you? Our gracious Father, we can never begin to understand or comprehend your love or your grace, but we can accept it and we can be transformed and changed by it. Father, we are thankful that Jesus was willing to pay it all. Help us, Father, to accept that payment, 
to be changed, to be transformed, to be more and more like Jesus because of his grace, because of his spirit, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we stand together?